so welcome to the English Revision Lectures. We're going to start off today with great expectations. Okay, my main focus I'm going for is giving you a little bit of coverage of the key things you should know, but also the peripheral characters. So all the extra characters and great expectations that you maybe don't know enough about, and if they come up tomorrow, could throw you. So I want you focusing on making sure you're kind of taking notes from this, getting the key bits of information, and feeling more confident as you go into tomorrow's exam. So the first thing I want to make sure you all remember is answer the correct question. Okay? So you have to do one from section A and one from section B. Great expectations is section B, and it's always the third question, so normally coming on about page 12. Okay? Please do not get mistaken and go on to Christmas Carol because that's Charles Dickens. You do not know anything about that. Make sure you go on to Great Expectations. So once you then get Great Expectations in front of you, you have your whole question paper. And the main thing you need to think about when you get this question paper in front of you is using all that information. Because your page gives you things that will help you answer it. And so the first bit is to look at this bit at the top. So pay attention to where it's placed in the novel. So this example here is in chapter 8. Okay, so always highlight that chapter and just make sure you're aware of it. You're aware of where this is happening within the text. Okay, we know chapter 8 is near the beginning. So that is important to our understanding. And then they give you a really simple summary. So a simple kind of explanation of what has been happening to this up to this point or in this part of the scene. Okay, so our example is in this extract, Pip has just met Stella for the first time. So we know that, we've got that little bit of information. So make note of it, be aware of it, because it's giving you that knowledge, giving you the understanding of what has been going on. The second thing I do, which I was doing with my classes before, is making note of its place within Freytag's pyramid. Okay, so you should have all seen this at some point. It's just the basic structure of a story. So our exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement or conclusion. So chapter eight is coming near the beginning. So it's exposition of a story. So that's a bit of terminology you can use. So saying like in the exposition, Pip is talking about Stella. Or starting in that way, using that language is a really great way to start. But also think, the book divides into three volumes. So I put up the numbers of the volume there if you want to note it down. So volume one is chapters one through 19. Okay, so that's the first part of Pip's expectations and we like to refer to it. Volume two is chapters 20 through 39. Okay, so the middle bit is life. Him in London up until Magritte's return. So that is volume two. And finally we get volume three. So chapters 40 through 59, we kind of get these bits and bobs after Magwitch's return. Magwitch kind of goes away, dies. Pip goes away for 12 years, comes back, and we get our sort of happily ever after. So you can then, if you remember which the volumes are, place it somewhere on this pyramid. And that gives you your structural kind of analysis of the text. Because remember, the examiner is expecting you to think of the imagery, the language, and the structure within your answer. Okay, even if you don't go into massive detail, but you're just saying like, I'm aware that this is happening at this point and this is effective because of this. Okay, so it's really useful in that sense. The same for kind of any of the texts you can do this. It's just about you being aware of the movement of the text and the function of the narrative. So, the other key things to be aware of in terms of key terms are using Bildungsroman and retrospective narrative. Okay, everyone should be familiar with these terms. So Bildungsroman is the story itself. It is a Bildungsroman. And it follows a uh, main protagonist as they grow up and develop through life. Okay, it could be as simple as you just using that word in your introduction, or you might analyse why Charles Dickens has used a Bildungsroman. Okay, so there's aspects to it that might get you more marks, but if it's not answering the question, don't feel like you have to go on a long thing about it, but just using the word will get you some marks. The second one is retrospective narrative. Okay, so the fact that our narrator is our protagonist as an old man looking back on his life. Okay, he's reflecting, he's the benefit of hindsight. He at times analyzes his own actions. So when you get that extract in front of you, 
you can go through it and you might find quotes that are him looking back. And you can say, like, actually, he's looking at this moment and realises what he did was wrong, or that he should have acted differently. So that's where you go. So Charles Dickens has used a retrospective narrator to do such and such. Okay, these key phrases and these key terms are really useful to your essay and to your analysis. Okay, so those two key terms there. And what I've put up here is actually a resource on the Academy website. So it's just kind of a breakdown of key chapters and what happens and when. Okay, so a really brief overview. If you need to recap the plot tonight, then by all means go and look at it. You've got that quick overview to remind you of what is happening and when. Again, the same with characters. There's so many resources out there. Please go through and just remind yourself who everyone is. I know in my classes today, someone's had a little bit of a confusion. I think it's last minute panic. So just take that time, establish in your head just who each person is. So, on to the kind of main things here then. So one key quote I've picked out, and for me it's the most important quote of a novel and could come into every single essay you write. And it's said by Joe Gardry when he visits Pip in London. Okay? And so this is his response after Pip has been rude to him. So you think Pip is now upper class, Joe's come to visit, Pip is embarrassed. And so he goes, Pip, dear old chap, life is made of ever so many partings welded together, as I may say. And one man's a blacksmith, and one's a whitesmith, and one's a goldsmith, and one's a coppersmith. Divisions among such must come and must be met as they come. So that quotation there is kind of the message of the text of the Bildungs Roman all in one go. So remember, Charles Dickens wanted to critique social class and Joe Gargery is a character who doesn't care about his class. He's a happy character, generally kind of goes on well in life after Mrs. Joe dies. And so this quote that he says is him going like, well, yeah, there are these divisions, there are these social classes, but they're there, acknowledge them, but don't care about them and you'll be okay. And obviously at this moment in time, Pip is caring massively about it, and that's really important to him. So that quote, even if you don't quote it exactly right, if you say that he says about one's a coppersmith, one's a whitesmith, one's a blacksmith, or just along those lines, and say that it's a metaphor for social class in the Victorian times, but also you can say it's representing the message of the whole novel. And that works as a really great bit of context as well. You are understanding why Charles Dickens is writing it. Okay? Remember the key thing is the Victorian era for this text, so making sure you're referring to it as that. We know there's division in social class at this time. And also, a really useful bit of historical information about Charles Dickens himself is he was a social reformer. So reformer meaning he wanted to change life for people. He wants to help out people who are poor. He wants to improve people's circumstances. So when you're thinking about, well, why did Charles Dickens write this? He wrote this because he wants people to realise the issues in society. The kind of divisions and problems about the people caring so much about their class that they let go of reality, they don't realise things. And so we get characters like Miss Hamsham who ends up in this totally unrealistic character, but it's all because of social class. So every single question should have class linked into it. No matter his character or theme, it's relevant to the whole text. So, we're now going on to the peripheral characters. And the first one to focus on is Wemmick. Okay, so Mr. Wemmick is Jaggers' clerk. Okay, so he works for him at the law firm. He's kind of, when he's in work, he's really kind of a gruff man. He's very business-like, he's quite dry with his humour. He's kind of really, doesn't come across as friendly to Pip. The first meetings with him aren't friendly at all. They're very much like, oh, you are meeting at this time and this is what's happening. But he's very different once he leaves work. When he's at home, he cares for his aged parent. He kind of softens and spends time with people. He looks after the local children. He gives them food. He's built his own house that he calls the castle. Okay, which is kind of representative of him having this fortress that keeps him away from the rest of society. So he knows he has to do his job. He needs that money. And when he's there, he'll be serious and business-like. But when he's at home, he's kind. So he's that character who manages to go between the two classes. 
he manages to be in one side, but because he doesn't let his emotions be part of it, he has his successful life. He's really good friends with Herbert Pocket and kind of always makes sure he's protected himself. Um, but yeah, so he's a way for Dickens to comment on how you could live that life. But he represents that you can function in society and not have to care about your class, but you can still be part of everything, but still have your own kind of views and own fortunes. So he's a really good character in that sense if you're talking about social class, and also if he does happen to be the question tomorrow, then you have a little bit more awareness of who he is. We know he links to Jaggers, and we know he helps Pip out as the story develops and as they kind of form their friendship. The next kind of peripheral character is Herbert Pocket. Quite often we all remember Herbert. He's Pip's friend. We also have to remember that Herbert's dad is also very interlinked with the story. A lot of the films cut out his dad. His dad's called Matthew Pocket. Matthew is actually the one that tutors Pip to be a gentleman. Herbert is his friend who kind of goes along with him as he tries to fit into society and be part of it. Okay? Herbert nicknames Pip Handel. He calls him that. He's very passionate and excitable. So kind of the fighting when you first meet him as a child, that kind of just approach straight to Pip that he wants to fight. And then as soon as Pip beats him, he shakes his hand and walks off again. He's very much kind of happy-go-lucky. Things don't faze him too much. But he's a really nice and decent person. So that's great about his character is he kind of cares and is really thoughtful about the way he acts. He's got really big dreams about being a capitalist, like he wants to master kind of being a business owner and making his own money. Even though he's from a family that he could have inherited money from, he moves away from that. He wants his own kind of path built. And at first Pip kind of will patronise Herbert a little. He looks down and he disagrees with his views. He thinks he should have used his family's money and stayed with it. But he does appreciate the, the lessons because Herbert has grown up in upper society. He has got things to learn from him. And then at the end, he realises he needs to help Herbert out more. Pip goes to Miss Havisham himself and says, like, can we have them out? Can we give him money? Pip uses the last of his money to help Herbert set up his business. So Herbert is kind of that guiding light, that moral centre that helps us realise how to behave and what to do. So he gives us that direction and gives us that focus. So then we've got Wemmick and Herbert there. So the next one is Biddy. So when we first meet her, she's younger. She is the one who kind of teaches Pip how to read and write. So the school that Pip goes to, the, it's meant to be run by kind of Biddy's relative who just falls asleep, she's old, and Biddy takes over. Um, she's described, kind of seen as a messy little girl who always wants brushing, washing and mending. So that's how Pip introduced us to her. So saying she needs to be fixed up, she's not good enough for him. Um, but eventually she grows up to a really helpful, intelligent and kind woman. She is the antithesis of Estella, so the direct opposite. Okay, if we think of how Estella is presented, Biddy is not her in any shape or form. So you can kind of think that maybe Dickens included her to make sure we have someone to compare to Estella that's the same age. So we can look at it in that sense. There's that comparison going on. He says kind of some of the most awful things about Biddy because she is really nice. And he says she was not beautiful. She was common and could not be like Estella. But she was pleasant and wholesome and sweet-tempered. So he starts off and he's like, well, to me, yeah, she's, she's not beautiful. She's a bit ugly. She's not good enough for me. She is not a Stella, for one. So he used that comparison himself. But she was pleasant, wholesome, and sweet-tempered. And remember, Pip is telling us this later in his life. So later in his life, he is still saying this about her, still has this slight viewpoint that she is beneath him. Um, so Billy becomes more significant as time goes on because once Mrs. Joe gets attacked by Orlick, she and um, becomes an invalid, Biddy kind of moves in to help and eventually, once Miss Joe is gone, she marries Joe. They have a family where they have a son that they actually call Pip and they live kind of a happily ever after scenario. They're two characters who get a happy ending and that's because they, she stays the same. She stays that same character, she doesn't change for people. No matter how much she wants Pip, she still stays that same person. 
Okay, so really key there with Biddy. Next we got Orlick. Quite a few people forget Orlick is a character. So Orlick is a journeyman at Joe's Forge, so he works for them. He's kind of between being an apprentice and so he's kind of earning money and Pip steps on his toes a bit. So when Pip becomes an apprentice, he loses any hope that he's going to develop. Orlick is a very kind of common character. He comes across as very rough and cruel. We don't feel any kind of sympathy towards him really because he's not very nice to people. He's described as a broad-shouldered, loose-limbed, swarthy fellow who slouches everywhere. So all the imagery surrounding him is very much negative. He's not a positive character. Because also Dickens wants to acknowledge that not everyone is good. Um, a list of the misdeeds he does, so the things he does wrong. So he threatens Pip when he's younger, attacks Mrs. Joe, joins up with Compton for some parts, he plans to kill Pip in the Sluis house, he comes on to Biddy, he robs and assaults Mr. Pumblechook. Okay? So that's just some of the things that he does. So he is kind of an evil character. He's in there to be kind of his antagonist to Pip. Okay? He's what everything that Pip isn't, because Pip is generally nice. But he's in there to kind of be this person, this enemy to Pip. We think Magwitch got complicated as an enemy, and then is kind of giving that balance to the story, giving him that person to kind of go up against. So all it's really important there. And if you've got a question on him, it's thinking, well, his function as a character there is to go against Pip himself. Right, next one, Bentley Drummle then. So Bentley Drummle, our most upper class character, he's basically aristocracy, so the top of the social hierarchy at that time, so kind of edging on royalty. He's an oafish, unpleasant young man who the reason they meet is because they get tutored by Matthew Pocket, so Herbert's dad. They both are in those spheres. Drummer also has connections to Jaggers, so they're both in that sense. They also, he's another antagonist for Pip, but this time of a higher class. So he's his nemesis, his enemy. He's mean, he's haughty, he's abrasive, he's not kind, he doesn't care about anyone, and he will make sure that he asserts his own status, that he maintains his own class. Jaggers actually becomes very interesting in drummer. He likes him, he likes what he can gain from him, but does tell Pip to stay away from him himself. He's not like, oh, he should be your friend. He knows he's dangerous. And we know that Drummer marries Estella. But in the end, Drummer does get his comeuppance, so he mistreats his horse, his horse kicks him in the head, and that is the end of Drummer. Okay? So I think Dickens decides to have this horribly cruel character who is upper class, who gets killed. Okay, so if you do bad things, or if you are a bad person within the social class, you will get some kind of act kind of done to you by the end of the book. And Dick has done that on purpose, and we think Drummle gets that, all it kind of gets imprisoned towards the end, Miss Havisham dies, so they all get these things coming back to them, and it's a very moral tale in that sense. We're going to get Compton, again. Another one of these bad characters, he left Miss Havisham at the altar. He's the convict we see at the beginning fighting with Magwitch in the mud. Um, so the reason they both were caught is they've been forging signatures. Compton got off easy because he was from an upper class and he turned up to the court in a suit. Magwitch did not. Okay. So And it was because of his curly hair and his black clothes and his white pocket handkerchief. So his handkerchief, like the way he dressed presents to everyone that he is better, he is a higher class. And then so eventually Compton drowns after he tries to get Magwitch caught out again when he returns to England. So again, he gets his comeuppance enacted upon him. That's Dickens trying to say, like, if you do bad things, you will get a punishment. So then Molly, so Molly just a quick one. So Jaggers is made, Estella's mother, Okay, she, Jaggers has looked after Molly, he was the one who set up Estella being adopted by Miss Havisham. Molly technically should have gone to prison because she killed Compeyson's wife. So when we get introduced to Molly, she has the scars all over her arms. And that's because she strangled Compeyson's wife to death. Compeyson's wife was slashing her arms with a knife. So Molly's a really powerful woman, she's a strong woman. But it's also then Estella's mother. So that link, the fact that we know Estella is actually from a lower class and her parents are Molly and Magwitch. This fact that every character is interlinked is purposeful. They're all meant to be related to one another. So then Matthew Pocket, I've already mentioned him when I was talking about Herbert. 
So he's the one that he's been in studies with in a house in Hammersmith. He's Miss Havisham's cousin, the only kind of member of the family who told her that Compton wasn't trustworthy, and that's how he lost favour with her. So Matthew and his immediate family kind of got ousted before the rest of the vultures because he told her that Compton was bad news and that he thought things weren't right before he left at the altar. And Miss Havisham sent him away thinking he was just being judgmental. Um, so he is kind of another good character which gets combined with Herbert in a lot of the interpretations of the text. So just make sure you remember that distinction. Matthew is the one who taught her, no, taught Pitt how to be a gentleman. Herbert is the one who accompanied him through it all. Okay, and he's really respected and eventually does, like Miss Havisham forgives him, they all kind of get back together as a family. Then Trab's boy, a real peripheral character here. He's only in the text. I feel like it's twice, but there's one main scene. And Trav's boy is meant to basically represent what Pip would have been if he hadn't improved his fortune. So he's from the same town as Pip. He's known as like the local bully. So when Pip goes to get his clothes, when he gets his money to become a gentleman, he goes to Trav's shop, and Trav's boy is kind of trying to brush over his feet, trying to put him down. But then Trav, who owns the shop, tells the boy to go away, tells him off for it, that he's mistreating someone of an upper class. So, and if, yeah, if the convicts had never been met, if Magwitch had never happened, this would have been Pip's life, he would have just been a blacksmith. He, basically, Trav's boy represents what Pip should have stayed as. Even though he's not a nice character, he should have been in that situation, he represents that difference. Then we get Mr. Pumblechook and Mr. Wopsall, so they're kind of the ones who are around at the beginning of the book with Mrs. Joe. So Mr. Pumblechook isn't a very likeable man, he claims that he's the one responsible for Pip's kind of fortune development. He says that he's like the one that gave him his first opportunity, so he takes a lot of claim there. But before anything like this happens, he's rude to Pip, he judges him. Him and Mrs. Joe are kind of like these two bullies in the household. We then also get Mr. Wopsall, who's the local village clerk. So he's kind of just this normal man from Pip's life that comes up again later on. So Mr. Wopsall decides to become an actor. And there's a whole scene, the whole chapter, where Pip goes and watches his performance, what I think is Hamlet. It's a very confusing scene. But he's there for a bit of comic relief. He's a character who's trying to add a kind of softer side, an easier side to the story. So then, finally then, we've gone through those characters, those things you need to know, and now there's just some key themes to cover. We know social class is really important, and that links into them. We have our theme of ambition or self-improvement. Okay, so I think Pip develops his build enjoyment, he goes through all these experiences, he kind of improves as he goes on. And so we get this moral theme to great expectations. Basically, affection, loyalty and conscience are more important than social advancement, wealth and class, okay? So the idea like ambition shouldn't be interrupting with who you are morally and as a person. Um, the idea at heart, Pitt's an idealist. Basically, every time he thinks that something should be, he'll try and do it. He doesn't realise the whole gravity of situations and just thinks the best things, that if he improves, his life will be better. And actually, that isn't what happened. The aim to always improve and be better doesn't bring him the happiness he thinks. But the idea of self-improvement, like great expectations, he's given these expectations. He should improve, he should develop as a person. So he's not quite doing it in the right way and it's not necessarily being the reward he thinks. So that's one of the key themes there. So the idea of having ambition and wanting self-improvement and it not perhaps achieving enough for you. So then this last theme then is the theme of consequences and that was what I was talking about mainly with all those characters that when you do something wrong or when you mistreat someone or when you act in a way that's very selfish you will get your consequence and kind of those who act with honour and are good get the good consequence at the end those who are bad or are cruel will kind of get the negative consequence and that was Charles Dickens really wanted that message to come across the idea that consequences will happen in life you can't just go on and be as you are and be ignored okay. 
So that is everything that I feel you need to know kind of the night before the exam for Great Expectations. We'll now go on to Romeo and Juliet. Right, so Romeo and Juliet. In my lecture, I'm going to cover the main themes and the main quotations and how they both link together. The highest mark responses for Romeo and Juliet will combine both a, a solid knowledge of the quotations and a solid knowledge of the main themes of Romeo and Juliet. And I want to understand the main themes and the main quotation of Romeo and Juliet through one character, Mercutio, um, and who I think is a really important character then in the play. So, to start off with, with our AO3 context, Shakespeare did not write the story of Romeo and Juliet. It comes from another English poet who translates an Italian story into the tragical history of Romeo and Juliet in 1562. And Shakespeare makes a couple of really important changes to the story, uh, to Brooke's story. First of all, it goes from a nine-month story, which is the time of Arthur Brooke's story, to the five-day version of Shakespeare's. And also the minor character in Brooke's story of Mercutio's of Mercutio is like developed hugely into a far more important character. Um, and the way I want to think of how important Mercutio is is thinking the main themes before his death, and then we'll talk about the main themes after his death. So if we look at the sort of two key acts before Mercutio's death, Act 1 and Act 2, I'd like to argue that actually Mercutio is really important, and the events then that sort of lead up to his death sort of show the main the play to be um, a romance, primarily. So if we just have a look at these sort of four, five key events, um, we start off with Romeo not formally being in love with Rosaline, and then the sort of next important face of event is that Romeo and Benvolio encounter the illiterate Capulet servant who has the invitations to the Capulet ball. Romeo there finds out that obviously Rosaline's at the party, so it gives him another motive to be there. At the Capulet ball, Tybalt is held back by Lord Capulet so that um, so obviously he wants to start a fight with the Montagues who have um, trespassed at the party. Because of that, uh, because Tybalt doesn't get involved, Romeo and Juliet can meet, they fall in love, and this then is the final key event before Tybalt comes in with Romeo, and because obviously Romeo is with Juliet at the time, Mercutio steps in and obviously dies. Um, so the play then, right at the start, is a, primarily a romance. Before Mercutio dies, the play is really romantic and the theme of love is evident. So there are three ways that love then is presented right at this, in the first two acts of the play. Love is presented as capricious, and by capricious I mean a sudden change of mood or behaviour. If we look at these two key quotes on the board, Romeo says of Rosaline, Oh, brawling love, oh, loving hate. Brawling as in fighting, love, loving hate, obviously two examples of oxymorons, and it shows like, the conflict of the emotion. Um, his love for Rosaline brings him obviously this sort of clashing feeling of love. It's strong, it's violent, but at the same time, obviously, because he knows he can't be with Rosaline, this is also a feeling of hatred. So it's sort of really strong, clashing oxymoron. It's showing that it's capricious. It's, it's sort of this swing between happy and sad. And the sort of most obvious example of Romeo's being, well, Romeo being capricious is when he sees, uh, when he says this, when he first sees Julia where he states, he says to her, he never saw true beauty till this night. So literally, like, two scenes ago, he was talking about how beautiful he thought Rosaline was, and it's taken a matter of an afternoon for him to change his mind, and so I think, oh, actually, I have never seen someone as beautiful as Juliet until this evening. So we're seeing then how love is it's sort of topsy-turvy. It's um, a real big clash of emotions. Love is also seen as immature in Romeo and Juliet. So, um, Juliet says to Romeo, deny thy father and refuse thy name. And what she means there is, she's talking about, of course, to ignore the family feud and we can be in love anyway. And obviously this is a really immature view. It's this sort of idea that, regardless of these years and years of, of, of feuding or violence, we can just ignore this and we can be together anyway. Yeah, refuse thy name, refuse, ignore the fact that you're a Montague, reject your father, reject the Montagues. And it shows then that Julia is initially immature, and obviously Romeo is another really immature character, um, as he sort of ignores all these boundaries of love in order to be with Julia. The romance then 
continues. Um, because ultimately, even though it's capricious, even though it's immature, ultimately, in Act 1 and 2, love is presented as optimistic. You could argue that obviously they should be a bit more sure, they should consider the family con uh, conflict. But what allows them to overcome the family conflict ultimately is their optimism. And the fact that their sort of love transgresses, it breaks all of the social boundaries in which they are tied down to. So Romeo says, you know, let lips do what hands do in his sort of sonnet when he's speaking to Julia. And this sort of transgression then is not only just of the families but also of religion. Here is a subversion of the religious imagery where he takes something like praying and turns it into um, the act of kissing. And obviously it's a subversive, it's going against what the church would have thought, what the church would have believed. And this sort of optimism, this fighting against society, is also represented for another religious figure, the Friar Lawrence. And religion then, another important theme of Romeo and Juliet, is shown to be uh, sort of subverted. It's shown to be something that's played around with and got and sort of fought against. Because the Friar Lawrence, even though as a, as a religious man, he's supposed to uphold societal values. He's to uphold the structures of society. But actually, he realises that the structure of society, the Montague's fight of the Capulets, isn't healthy. It's not good for society. So his like, big motivation for the play is to go against the societal norm and change and restructure society. And he thinks that the marriage of Romeo and Juliet, which he facilitates ultimately, can solve that. So in his important quote, when he marries them together, to turn your household's rancor to pure love. So to turn your household's hatred into love. And he thinks that through their love, the families can sort of, all their heat scars of the family conflict can be cured. Yeah? So romance then, a, romance and love are really important themes in Act 1, Act 2 of Romeo and Juliet. And this changes when Mercutio dies. Because of Mercutio's death, Romeo is banished, because obviously he goes into the Tibble. Because Romeo is banished, Juliet is forced to marry Paris. Um, obviously she's really angry at her dad, that uh, um, Paris is suggested as um, a quite suitable shooter. And because of all these emotions, because her cousin's died, because Romeo is banished, and because she's forced to marry her cousin, uh, married Paris, sorry, uh, Juliet then attempts to commit suicide. Um, because she attempts to commit suicide, Friar Lawrence has to come up with a plan, desperately to try and solve the situation. Uh, that plan fails, and because of his failure, his plan, Romeo and Juliet dies. So after Mercutio's death in Act 3, 4 and 5, the theme of love disappears, and the play firmly becomes a tragedy. Um, and because of tragedy, the theme of conflict here from Act 3, 4 and 5 becomes more and more evident. There's three main types of conflict. Of course, there's a family conflict. We've got the sort of conflict between the two families. But this conflict between the two families, as the play develops, sort of turns inwards, and it becomes a conflict within the families. Lord Capulet says to his daughter, disobedient wretch, get thee to church on Thursday, which obviously means he's telling her off, so I have to go to church and get married anyway. Um, and we can see his sort of aggressive term use of the exclamation mark, and this also marks obviously a change in his relationship with Julia. Previously, in the romantic part of the story, it was really good, it was really idyllic, but now, in Act 3, that turns around, and it becomes um, obviously a lot more aggressive, and he's a lot more angry. It's important to see this quote from two sides, obviously. He is on one side being a bully and horrible to his daughter. We must also consider the context of the time of the patriarchal society, the male-dominated society, where it would have been okay for, um, for fathers, obviously fathers were in charge of the household, so in some ways at the time, a contemporary reader, a contemporary audience, sorry, would have seen that as um, acceptable, because it's the father just disciplining his daughter. There's also then emotional and mental conflict. Um, the most obvious example is the attempt to commit suicide. It's important to remember that both Romeo and Juliet attempt to commit suicide once before their actual suicide at the end of the play, both of which are in front of Friar Lawrence. Um, so we've got Romeo in the stage direction drawing his dagger in Act 3, Scene 3. So after he's been banished, he obviously doesn't want to, he thinks he'll never be a Juliet ever again, he'll never see Juliet, so he chooses to take his own, attempts to take his own life. And then same with Juliet in Act 4, Scene 1, when she thinks that um, she's going to be married to Paris for the rest of her life, which obviously she doesn't want. So she says to the front lines, I long to die. 
And again, suicide is another way that the play subverts religious values. The religion at times if you commit a suicide, you would be rejected from heaven. And this portrayal of suicide then shows how religion is being subverted, with both of them being unreligious in their um, attempts to be with each other. Yeah. And is there emotional and mental conflict? And finally, the, big, the biggest conflict really is their fight against fate throughout the story. So we're told in the prologue that they're Star Wars lovers, that they're Death Mark Love. And we as an audience, and they as an audience, would have known that as everything was happening, they were fated to die. Yeah. And obviously because of the death it brings about the peace for their families. And so the dramatic irony that runs throughout the play is that they both desperately fight against their fate not knowing that as they fight against their fate, they become, they get closer and closer to meeting their fate. So, Romeo, at five, scene one, is waiting for a note from Juliet, um, only to realise that the Friar Lawrence's plan has failed, Friar John has been quarantined from Mantua, and he cannot give a note telling him about their plan. So, Romeo then, in the quote, I defy you stars, thinks that he is going against his fate, which he thinks is not to be with Juliet, but in doing so, in going against his fate, he ends up living out the actual fate, which is for him to die with Julia. Yeah. So obviously the fight against fate um, is ultimately shown as being in vain and unsuccessful. And then the themes of love and conflict are the point I want to make with these two, even though one, love is obviously in Act 1 and Act 2, conflict is in Act 3, 4 and 5, but it's not a simple like, divide. You know, the love doesn't just disappear after Act 2, the conflict doesn't just appear in Act 3, 4, and 5. We must remember, obviously, there's conflict with the servants right at the start, and then there's love throughout Act 3, 4, and 5. And the reason that I've divided them is also show that they're inextricably bound together. Love and conflict, love and death in Romeo and Juliet go hand in hand. Because um, with their love, they, uh, their love is ultimately marked by death, they have to die because they're in love, but at the same time, if they don't die, then their family's feud can never be solved. So in the play, um, Shakespeare combines love and sort of death, love and conflict together, because out of this, like, their fiery love comes the peace of that their families desperately need. They ultimately cannot avoid their fate, yeah, which obviously is another big theme in Romeo and Juliet. Um, and really, fate is the overarching theme that sort of combines love and death, love and conflict together. And then we've got two more important quotes about that then. Violent delights have violent ends. Friar Lawrence sort of says, it foreshadows in his wedding speech to Romeo and Juliet, that um, because of their violent, the way they came together so quickly as a couple, um, it will obviously end badly as well. Violent here takes on two different meanings. So violent end as in their death being a violent end, but also a violent delight as in sort of the clash of their love uh, to be together. And finally, the, sort of, the key quote really for the prologue, the star cross lovers, really has three meanings we've got up on the board. Star cross and they're meant to be together. Star cross again, is they'll sort of be together in the stars, so the idea that they can't be together on earth, but they have to be together in heaven. And as a Shakespearean audience, they would have realized that um, stars were an obvious symbol at the time, and it's sort of the chaos of the stars as they're being mixed up together, the sort of chaos of violence being shown here. Yeah. Um, and just to link it back then to what Miss um, Matthew was saying earlier, we can also map Romeo and Juliet onto Fraser Crib. And quite nicely, because of the five acts of Romeo and Juliet, it maps nicely onto the five points. Um, so you've got your exposition in Act 1, setting the scene, there's a conflict, uh, they're, falling, they're falling in love, the rising action of course is their marriage, and their and the wedding is arguably just before the climax. And then the climax, as I've said, is sort of Mercutio dying, because after that everything goes badly, um, plans have come together, fails, they all meet in tomb, and they all die. Um, you can map it onto that, and Finally, yes, yeah, the final exam tips then for Romeo and Juliet, moving on to sort of the technical stuff. With AO1, remember references count. So even if you can't remember those specific quotations, you can just say you know, in Act 1 when Romeo is in love with Rosaline. That's absolutely fine. You can talk about that and that counts as AO1. Um, slight mistakes in your quotations are not marked down. So you're better off having an attempt at the quotation, 
trying to remember a part of that quotation, they're not using the quotation at all. Yeah? Remember, to make your quotation as short as possible, um, and just have the key words, the sort of key two, three words in that. For assessment objective two, don't forget that subject terminology isn't just adjective, isn't just like personification, alliteration. The word protagonist, playwright, characterization, imagery, all of that counts as, a, as your assessment objective two. You should all be able to use the word protagonist in your essays. Just saying the protagonist, Romeo, the protagonist, Juliet, the playwright, Shakespeare, the characterization of um, Juliet, whoever, that should all be fairly easy. Analyze the extract for you. If you can't remember any quotation at all for whatever reason, then just analyze the extract there in front of you. And don't forget for AO3, the demonstrative knowledge of the rest of the text also counts as context. So knowing that whatever happens in Act 1, whatever happens in Act 2, if the um, extra is about Act 3, also is fine. Um, and finally, just remember you get four marks at AO4 to read your essay and make sure your grammar, your grammar and spelling is okay. Any questions to wrap up? Otherwise,